Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Interpreting Specifications. This course has been given number 11824 by the North Carolina Irrigation Contractors uh, Licensing Board and it is worth uh, one half credit of CEU or continuing education. And as most of you guys have noticed, um, on the website uh, we have three one half hour credit courses, uh, two of them being on the technical or irrigation side and one being on the business side. And why we did that was because we had a lot of contractors calling us uh, saying, hey, I need a half a credit. I've got nine and a half hours or I've got five and a half. Do you have a half hour class? And then I get the remaining um, uh, solid one hour courses. And so we have those. So there's there's a total of 10 and a half new hours for this year. Uh, December of 2019 uh, then these courses um, so three one-half credits we have two courses that are worth two hours each and so that gives us a total of five and a half and then I have the uh, the four uh, classes that are worth one hour uh, each so we have a total of ten and a half new hours so guys if you've taken everything with me in the past you'll be able to get ten and a half new hours uh, from from here uh, through the end of the year. So well, let's go ahead and get started with interpreting specifications. This is a topic dear to my heart because a lot of contractors do not pay any attention to the specifications. And, and why is that? Well, for one, the general contractor is almost like they're keeping this specifications book hidden from you. you a lot of the times you're going to have to ask for it. You're either going to have to ask for an emailed copy of it, or if you're going to uh, some of the plan rooms, uh, you'll have to uh, you know, ask to get a copy so that you can uh, look through it. And we all have made the mistake of only looking at the parts that would merely contain to us. We really need to look through the whole book. We need to read the whole book, especially... Uh, when it comes to uh, the general conditions, but we, you know, we kind of focus on those technical specifications of the work that we're going to be performing and not knowing that our work may be listed in another section in the technical specifications. I mean, I've seen it where the landscape contractor uh, is responsible for uh, putting up the erosion control uh, fencing and doing the, uh, the rip wrap driveway into the construction site and they did not include that on their bid so i've seen horror stories like that and they actually have to put up you know several thousand feet of silt fence and uh, you know several loads of riprap and construct that entry drive into a construction site because all they did was look at the landscape work they did not look at the erosion control portion of the specifications and next thing you know, they've turned in a bid and they have the superintendent call them on day one. Hey, we need our silt fence up. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I, di I didn't bid on the silt fence. Well, they're like, well, it's in the specifications. Well, I didn't see a copy of the specification. Well, that is your fault as a contractor. You are licensed by the state of North Carolina to provide uh, a quote or an estimate that includes everything needed on the project so we can't ever say that we didn't see the specifications we now know that we have to obtain a copy and actually read those specifications so um been some horror stories out there you've heard me talk about it in my classes uh before as well and so learning objectives yeah we're not going to hit all of these um because a lot of you already know measure a construction drawing using a scale hopefully most uh everybody listening to this course uh knows how to use a scale what i have found is uh when we teach uh landscape construction at the college that's a uh, fall semester first year uh, we really get involved heavily with the use of scales and uh, by the time the students get to landscape design we do have to uh, repeat that lesson and kind of brushing them up on reading a scale because you know it is it's kind of like plant materials it, you you lose the names of those plants if you don't use it every day but you know coming through the program that I did in school I mean you know we had to have a scale for everything that we did so um, it's second nature to us and I'm sure it's second nature to you guys out there listening uh, comprehend what construction activities are required from construction plans and specifications. What is it that you have to do? Are you providing the irrigation system only? Or are you providing both landscape and irrigation? Or are you only doing 
landscape. And, and a lot of times, you know, these contractors are going to submit bids to the landscape contractor and they're going to leave it up to you to, to get the quotes uh, on the irrigation. It may be included in the whole umbrella of landscape work. And so you may be responsible of having to hire that irrigation contractor. That's why you need to read those specifications and then build a landscape project from a set of plans and specifications. And, you know, unfortunately in this one half hour credit class, we're not going to do that, but we definitely talk about the, uh, the paperwork and the estimating and, and all the information that are included in those specifications. And so, um, this, like I said, guys, this is a subject dear to my heart. Uh, I've seen too many guys get burned, uh, by not reading the specification. And I know exactly why the GC does it. I mean, they're like, well, you submitted a quote. You, you are responsible for, for, for doing all this work. And they get the erosion control done at no charge. They get other things done at no charge. I mean, so it, it's kind of a, kind of a sneaky way, especially when they have, um, you know, somebody new to the industry that's really just, uh, recently got their license, hadn't been in it long enough. You know, we all, have been burned that time or two and and you know when we learn from our mistakes we never make those mistakes again and so they that's why they like the the new guys and gals in the business and uh, we're going to provide information necessary to ensure that the project is built exactly as to the owner's desires that is that is our goal right we are here to take care of the owner a lot of times the owner is going to be represented uh, by owner's um, representative. Yeah, and that's uh, usually the landscape architect, sometimes maybe a project engineer or uh, or the building architect. But a lot of times with the work that we're doing, we're always dealing with the landscape architect. And these are the guys and gals that are writing these specifications. They're either going to come from the landscape architect, they're going to come from the engineer, and they're going to come from the architect. Now, guys, Yes, we do see some written information on the landscape plans. We'll see uh, some construction details on how to plan a plant, how to build the arbor, how to build the pergola. A lot of that is considered a construction document, but those are details. You still need to get the specifications. They're, they used to be in like uh, phone book size documents. You know what I mean? Just a huge, huge three ring binder with the specifications printed in it, or sometimes they would even get them, um, you know, binded, uh, almost like a textbook, but they I always called them the phone book because they were that thick. Uh, now they're probably all produced electronically. So you could easily, you know, uh, obtain a copy of it. Make sure you get the entire copy. You know, when you call the office of the GC and you say, I need a copy of the specifications, make sure that you get the entire thing. Just don't get the landscape portion because like I said, there might be things in the erosion control that you have to do. There may be something uh, in the plumbing section that you have to do because you're, you're the irrigation contractor. Make sure you get the entire specifications and at least read through it, briefly look through it and make sure that it isn't, does it, that it does not say, hey, landscape contractor responsible for this, irrigation contractor responsible for this in another section uh, not listed in the landscape work. But again, like I said, the landscape architect, the engineer or the architect are going to be the ones writing these uh, specifications. And guys, if you ever get involved in a lawsuit or anything like that, hopefully not. Uh, the specifications is what holds up in a court of law, not the construction plans. Uh, the judge is always going to say, hey, well, you know, what's in the specifications? Well, again, as a licensed professional, you are required to obtain every information needed to uh, take care of this owner and bring it to their des desired their desired results. It's uh, there's no excuse, guys, when you have a professional license not to uh, obtain this information. It, it just won't hold up in court. All right. So. Within the specifications, there are the general conditions um, and our general conditions, you know, they're the non technical aspects of work. Uh, it is the bidding information. It's usually going to include a sample contract uh, on how to um, to submit your bid. It's the, you know, the GCs are the ones writing the contract. You're going to submit the bid and they're going to you're going to see a, a sample contract that they're going to do in the general conditions. You're also going to see within that bidding information. 
uh, invitations to bidders. You know, they're going to release that uh, that bid request. You know, they're going to have a list of contractors that they've worked with in the past. They're going to make it publicly uh, announce that, hey, you know, we're accepting bids for it. There's going to be instructions to the bidders on how to uh, to do it, how to submit their bid. There may be a pre-bid meeting that you are required to go to before you can even submit the bid. There's going to be the bid form. There's going to be a non collusial affidavit, a bid bond form, and then receipt of addenda acknowledgement. All that's usually going to be a part of it. You may also see... Um, you know, forms used during construction, notice to proceed, a change order example, uh, a certificate of payment, a uh, certificate of substantial completion, and then some lien releases. So all of that uh, still part of our, what we call the general conditions. And it's also going to define the roles and responsibilities of not only the contractor, but to the owner as well. Uh, it's going to have clauses addressing contract time, payment, completion, retention of fees, changes in work, correction of deficient work, bonding, insurance. It's going to tell you exactly how much you have to have uh, for this job, royalty payments, related contracts, and then protection of the work. So a lot of information in those general conditions, and it really applies to everybody. It replies uh, or um, it involves every tradesman that is on the job, not just, um, you know, the landscape contractor. This is for everybody. So make sure you read those general conditions. Uh, then you're going to move like into the supplemental conditions, uh, which is number three here on the chart. But again, uh, yeah, and we talked about that rules and responsibilities of all parties, the clause, your supplemental conditions is going to be uh, government requirements that will govern work, such as the anti kickback regulations. Uh, prevailing wage rates, adherence to civil rights, non-discrimination in la uh, labor uh, legislation, warranties and guarantees, subcontractor approvals, uh, temporary fixtures and utilities. Um, you know, there again, hey, you're the irrigation contractor. They might even ask you to uh, uh, to come and and put a um, temporary water fixture uh, for brick masons you never know guys that's why i want you to read these specifications and i might be stretching it a bit there but uh you know i, I wouldn't put nothing past these uh, uh gcs you know when they get these specifications and, and of not letting you guys uh, see what needs to be done uh request for material submissions and approval of substitution requirements hey what if you can't find a certain plant that the architect is uh, specified. Well, you might have to uh, do a substitution and, and see what else we can do for our clients. And then other requirements retaining specifically to the project will all be found in those supplemental conditions. And then we've got our technical specifications. And these are the descriptions of the methods, materials, and performance of project components. This, this is our trades work. This is exactly what we're going to do on the job. Uh, it's going to it's going to spec out whether we're using Rainbird, Hunter or Toro products. Uh, they tell you if it's, um, you know, the size of the pipe, you know, um, they're telling you everything about the project, the, the caliber of the tree, everything. You're going to find this in the technical specs, usually non landscape trades specifying products and installation. And then they are. Um, grouped by the trade and you will find your work like underneath what they call the landscape work earthwork uh grading erosion control all of those things you're going to uh to have to check out in those uh technical specifications um trying to think anything else about the text um the master spec is, is published by ARCOM or the American Institute of Architect. It's it, it's kind of a generalized format that is tailored to each project. Uh, there are 35 divisions. Uh, landscaping and site work division is the, is the division 32, but also seen in the tw uh, number 12 site furnishings and 26 exterior lighting. You know, hey, landscape contractor is to install up light uh, on the trees coming in the entrance drive. I mean, so you've got to check each and everything of that. And then as well as the 31 earth moving. But just remember that there are 35 divisions in the ARCOM and AIA 
uh, master spec. And I, I remembered using this in, in undergraduate. Um, you know, we had the uh, American Institute of Architects um, master spec book like that. And guys, this was really, I mean, I'm, I'm showing my age here. This is before, I mean, word processing existed, uh, but it didn't exist in every single lab and classroom on campus. Uh, but we would take the um, the master spec book. It was a big printed book, and then we would uh, take like whiteout tape and uh, white out what we didn't need, and then take it to a manual typewriter and type in um, what we needed for our jobs that we were doing in class. Like we would we would design a project, we do the construction documents on it, and then we would prepare. Um, this this publication these specifications and we'd, we'd have to do it the old school way with the typewriter and whiteout tape and then make a photocopy and then pull that whiteout tape off and put it back into the um the the master copy there in the classroom so uh thank goodness for computers right guys uh there's a master format by csi the uh, construction specifications institute there's two types there's material and workmanship specification, and then there's performance uh, specifications. Your, uh, your performance specifications are without providing specific materials or methods, performance specifications prescribe the results that a component of construction must obtain. You know, how is it that you're going to get it done? What is it going to look like when it is 100% done? Uh, this type of specification limits the contractor only in producing a product that looks and performs as the designer intended. And yes, guys, I mean, uh, your owner that you're working for has hired these designers to to get the look that they want. And it is your responsibility uh, to make sure that uh, you do it. And these performance specifications are going to uh, uh, make sure that you do it. Your material and workmanship specifications. Sorry, guys, I keep getting, hitting my head on the mic here. Um, the material and workmanship specifications uh, detail the material and construction procedures to be used to complete the pro uh, each project component. This type of spec restricts the contractor to use only those elements that the designer has chosen. Again, you, you're going to, if they're specking out Rainbird, you've got to spec Rainbird. If they're, you know, telling you to do Hunter rotors and uh, pop-ups, that's exactly what you're going to do. And there's two types um, of these material and workmanship specifications. You've got closed specs and then you've got open specs. The closed specs limit the contractor's choice of methods and materials. That, that, that's, that's them saying you're using Hunter or you're using Rainbird or you're using Toro. Open specs gives the contractor more of a choice of materials and methods. And these open specs may list two or three alternative brands or models um, that, you know, are, you know, considered equivalent. So they, they might say you can use Hunter, Toro, or Rainbird uh, in a scenario like that. But those are in your open specs. So you have open and closed specs. All right, material and workmanship specs. Again, you know, the detailed materials and construction procedures. The designer chooses the materials when they are closed. Can begin with warranties, material, and delivery and reference standards. And uh, it is the second part that indicates the materials for that. I may be jumping the gun a little bit. I, I tend to run my mouth a little bit faster than, uh, than staying with these slides. And so, yeah, we already talked about closed specs, open specs. And, and basically, the closed specs, guys, no subs. Uh, you cannot use any substitutions for it. It is exactly what the designer is saying. And then the open specs, they give you a list of things that you can choose from. And, and I'd say pretty much, uh, you know, irrigation is a great example of that. Pretty much when they're picking out plant material, they're, they're wanting to use those plant materials, uh, especially a landscape architect. Now, I have seen it where uh, a building architect or even a civil engineer has done the planting plan. And they may say, you know, provide shade tree, you know, two and a half inch caliber, inch and a half caliber, um, certain height already. So I have seen specs like that. And you're able to, uh, you know, find that maple or find that um, oak tree or, or, you know, anything that's uh, close to the job site for one. Uh, but, you know, something that you can, you know, get your hands on. So, you know, I, I kind of like those 
uh, open specifications when it's uh, a design done other than a landscape architect. Because usually that landscape architect is going to specify, hey, I want this tree, this size, this is where you're going to locate. And I love it when they tell you where you're going to locate it because that, uh, that puts everybody on a fair, um, gives everybody a fair chance to bid on the job correctly. Uh, and then, you know, the last part describes the detailed installation methods to be used. Again, we are building it to the owner's desires. Uh, no if, ands, buts, or about it. All right, performance specs prescribes the result of what a component of construction must attain. Again, I ran my mouth a little too early on that, and we talked already talked about it. Must look and perform as the designer intended. And guys, a lot of the times, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with two types of landscape architects. I love them to death. You know, you guys know that is my undergraduate. Um, I, I love um the world of landscape architecture and, and, you, and you've got two types you've got the uh, the landscape architect that's going to design the project that's going to remain throughout the whole construction process that's going to come by and do inspections they're going to sign off on it you know they're going to make sure that this design is 100 percent uh intended built as they intended it and then you've got the the, the la that does not show up at all you know their office might be two states away on some of these construction sites and you never see a representative uh, of the landscape architecture office so you're going to be just dealing with the uh, site super uh, from the general contractor's office so um, you know it's I don't know I, I don't I don't get that if I if if I was to do a big design like that I'm gonna make sure uh, my stuff is looking like I uh, wanted it to be you're also going to see the addenda. These are changes before the bids. Um, so you're going to have the original set of construction plans, and then there's going to be some addenda. You know, the owners decided to make a change prior to bidding, and so you will get the uh, addenda, uh, you know, coupled with the, the original plans. So you'll see what it was changed to. And then there's change orders. These are changes after contracts are signed. So let's say you've got the job. And then the owner wants to come back and switch out maples for oaks, or they want to switch out brick pavers for concrete pavers. Any any type of change like that, there would be a change order submittal. And you're going to see examples of those in the bid documents. You're going to have you know blank copies of those uh, for it. And so what it is, if the owner um, goes to the designer says, hey, let's uh, let's switch out um, the brick pavers for a concrete paver. Um, you know, let's make it happen. You know, they're going to come to you and say, hey, we need to get a change order. Uh, they want to switch out the, you know, the brick pavers for concrete pavers. And so you'd, you'd be responsible finding the cost difference. Um, you know, nine times out of 10 guys, it's going to cost more money, right? Uh, and, you know, I've always heard of people, if they mess up on one part estimating, you know, this is where they can kind of, you know, throw a little extra in there to cover them on something they've lost money. Is that ethical? You know, no, it's not, but, uh, you know, it happens all the time. I've seen some change orders, you know, minimal changes to the, to the construction job and, you know, cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, your plans guys, this is the graphic tool. It's going to, it's going to give you the location of the job. It's going to give you the grade and it's going to give you the improvements. Uh, so you might see some existing elements on the demolition page. Uh, you know, what comes down, what stays, uh, but your, your plans are graphically how the work is to be built. Again, we need them in the field doing the jobs, but uh, you know, your specifications is what's going to hold up in a court of law. Scale, you know, we have architect, engineer, um, you know, architect is fractional divisions, engineer is multiples of 10. You know, if there are dimension lines on the plan, those will um, supersede the, the scale. You will always go by the dimension lines if the designer has placed it. And you might see uh, dimension lines on such things as construction details. Um, I, I've seen them a few times on a planting plan. Uh, but typically it's, uh, you know, for your construction details, you would see that most of, uh, most of your 2d plans or bird's eye view, we're going to be using an architect or engineer. If it's an architect, you know, the two main scales I've always seen is quarter, uh, quarter inch equals a foot or eighth of an inch equals a foot quarter and eighth scale. And then an engineer, you know, one inch equals 10 feet or one inch equals 20. And I have, uh, seen several, um, 
landscape architects use 30 scale. It just depends on how big the project is. Uh, you know, good late friend of mine, Jerry Weicker, who passed away recently, you know, he did a lot of work in 30 scale. So, you know, it just, just depends on the designer itself. Um, but, you know, the, the main four we see, quarter and eighth in architect, and then one inch equals 10 and one inch equals 20 uh, for the engineer side of the scale. Types of drawings, plan view. Um, again, you know, it's length and width. It is the bird's eye view. It's almost like taking a drone and flying up and seeing uh, what's below you. Cross section is a vertical cut through. It has the height and length or the width. And then you have an elevation. It is a vertical surface height and length or width. Um, so some pretty cool stuff there. You know, a lot of landscape architects will do uh, the elevations and the, the cross sections. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're typically building our project based on the plan view. Line types, darker lines is for the structure. Lighter lines are the dimensions. Um, you know, your structure should be the darkest line on the set of plans. CAD, you know, everything that we see now is going to be CAD. You know, they have uh, the option of PDF portable documents. So, guys, you know, take out your uh, um, iPad. You know, you've got a set of prints there on it. And I love the new big iPads. I mean, those things are huge. Uh, so you can actually take uh, the set of plans and look at it. And you can blow them up, you know, zoom in on certain parts. And then, uh, you know, shop drawings, guys. They represent the contractor's or supplier's interpretation of the designer's requirements um, from uh, the construction documents. Now, what what is happening with our, uh, you know, the shop drawings is basically as as built. Or let's say, uh, and, and we might not see it as an irrigation or landscape contractor, but let's say the uh, the architect has uh, designed some type of steel beam structure over a pedestrian walkway, and you know the architect's not really set up to design that type of steel beam that's going to be holding up a roof, you know, like a covered walkway over a pedestrian uh, sidewalk. Uh, and so the the builder or the GC of that that's going to, in, you know, build that pedestrian cover, they would submit those plans to like a steel manufacturer or, or you know, structural engineer kind of person that will design that. They will submit their shop drawings to get approved and once they're approved, they can go ahead and actually cut those, you know, those steel trusses or joists, whatever they need to to make that happen um, to build that covered walkway. And so, like I said, we're we're typically not going to uh, to have to do that unless we're building some kind of pergola or a um, maybe some type of uh, uh, fancy woodwork or something that, you know, we've got to have a super long beam and, and actually have to get uh, an engineer firm to, uh, to design it and manufacture it for us. The as built, you know, these are the record drawings, you know, especially for irrigation because a lot of times guys, you know, like I said, when we did all the O'Reilly auto parts, we would, uh, you know, Craig Schneider, the architect would say, you know, landscape contractor to do an irrigation plan and submit uh, as built irrigation. And we did it all over the Southeast. And so it's different in every state and it's different in every municipality, but we would take the landscape drawing plan. I'd always take a clear uh, cut, like nice clean paper. And I would mark where the heads were. I would mark where the valves were, where the controller was. Uh, pretty much everything do the as built on top of the, um, the landscape plan. And I would do it in different colored markers. You know, uh, the previous lecture that we talked about, you know, the turf and landscape uh, irrigation best management practices, you know, it's talking about you need to use dashed lines for the main line, solid lines for the lateral line. I kind of did it with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the different colored Sharpies, uh, the Pentel sign pens and, and marked up the heads and lateral lines and stuff. Uh, and that, and that's perfectly fine, but you need to check, uh, you know, what is it that the owner wants and what is it that the, uh, the county or municipality wants for, for that as built as well. Um, site preparation is site demo. 
Then you got site layout. These are the construction staking. You know, it can be in grid format. Dimensions are referenced from two baselines. Baseline is a single reference line. That's you know, page 29. This is, you know, I use this a lot in, in, in at the college too. But it is in, if you're a landscape contractor, uh, it is in the special edition landscape construction, uh, North Carolina Landscape Contractor Licensing Board Manual of Practice. This is the book that they want people to study to get their license. Um, and then object dimensioning. This is the distance off of a nearby object. And all of this is really super cool to actually uh, to have students do this and um, you know pull some string lines and actually do this is is a good lab. Grading plans, you know, you've got the benchmarks at the elevation that serves as the reference point for all existing and proposed grades for the site, permanent location. Uh, and accessible the, that that benchmark has to be accessible by everybody and it needs to be protected and highly visible you know put some orange uh, fencing around it or whatever make sure that it is going to not get disturbed during construction contour lines dashed or existing solid are the proposed we may or may not have to deal with this, but it's good to know how they're going to move the earth around, especially when we're going to come in and, and do some uh, irrigation trenching. But uh, uh, know where spot elevations are, know what the finished floor elevation is. That way we can make sure we grade, uh, you know, or do our fine grading, make sure the water's getting away from the building, which is always a problem. And then some other things that uh, may entail us is the utility plans. Uh, planting plans, definitely a plant schedule or your plant list, and then the construction details of any things that we may be constructing for our client. And guys, again, that uh, this information comes from uh, you know the NCLCLB Manual of Practice Landscape Construction um, by David Sauter. So anyway, guys, I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.